is the author of Sound of Her Voice, described as harrowing, compelling, and quite brilliant by the New Zealand Herald, and a double finalist in the Nio Marsh Awards. He writes under a pseudonym, which I don't really know what his real name is, uh, because of his policing past. He lives in Auckland and spent several years working undercover investigating the most serious crimes as a detective. And I don't know anything else about you, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> it's so secret. Um, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read from the prologue. I'm going to read from the prologue um, as well because it's the only chapter I can find without swearing every second line. Um, so I apologise if there is a bit of that anyway. August 1995. The chill cut right through my duty jacket. A downdraft before the storm front. The rain started to fall cold. I shivered and looked up, staring at the night as the water started to splash across my forehead. We were parked up near the pool hall on Target Road. It offered a decent view of the Wairau Valley and Link Drive industrial area. A regular favourite of commercial burglars. Glanced over the roof at Andy, raised my eyebrows. He nodded, stamped out a cigarette, swept the water from his ginger hair and got back in the driver's seat. I slid it on my side and pulled the door. I fired up the heater, the car warmed up while the rain hit the windscreen. Harder now. Brief comfort broken by the radio. Comms operator was panicked, worked up. A 1010 call. Something going down out in Cunyu. Another patrol car, I car as they're known, in trouble. Someone seriously hurt or about to be. No cars free. West all tied up. Another car on the shore called for details. I reached up to the console. Flashing red and blues lit up the dark around us. Andy put his foot down, taking us out of the valley, up onto Waiau Road and north toward the Hobsonville turn-off. I'd been out of college a little over three months. Skinny 18-year-old, green ass. I've been dicking around in my final year of high school less than 12 months ago. How did I end up here again? Luck, no other way to explain it. We hit the 70k area north of Sunset Road, heading for the turn-off onto Upper Harbour. I adjusted myself in the seat, leaned forward to the glove box, pulled the map book out. Andy was throwing us in and out of the turns on Upper Harbour with his foot on the floor. I'd been listening to the radio and was fucking about with the map, trying to find Deacon Road. I knew Andy would be taking us up State Highway 16 into Kimu, but from there he'd be relying on me. Kimu was a rural area on the urban fringe northwest of the city. My knowledge of it extended to the bakery, the pub, and the girlfriend back in Fitborn, so not much. I found the page I needed and picked out the intersection of Riverhead and Deacon. We accelerated over the Green Life Bridge. Normally at night you can see across the water to the Fenerbahce Air Force Base. Tonight the winter weather had destroyed all visibility. The rain kept hammering the windscreen. And we passed some fields on our left and some shops on both sides before heading right into Brigham Creek Road. Combs was desperately trying to get more out of the unit than the ship, but nothing was coming back. That wasn't good. Andy was tearing the road up, pushing it as far as he could without losing it completely. As we hit State 16 and turned right, heading north. I gave our position to comms over the radio in the hope the crew in trouble could hear us and would know we were close. The words cut across the channel, strained and forced through gritted teeth. Comms, HSI, we've been shot at. Status one, I've got gunshot wounds, we need ambos. Confusion. Both shot or just one? Someone was status one. Fuck it, we'd soon find out. There was some back and forth between comms and the unit, clarifying it was safe for us to come in. I could feel the frustration from the guy who'd been shot. He was getting, I was getting frustrated myself. Because fuck it. I didn't care what was where. Despite the fact we didn't have firearms, Andy and I were going to be going in the street. It's clear. My partner's dying. I'm hurt bad. Get the ambulance here. Shit. Both shot. We were going to be the first car there. I'm going to skip a bit because it's going to take too long. <laughs> the description, description, description. <laughs> driving, driving, driving. Seeing things out the window. I directed Andy left onto Riverhead Road and straight on towards the Deacon intersection. I saw the red and blues from HSI up through the rain. Andy came in right behind them. As I got out, I could smell the tyres, feel the heat. All I could hear was the rain splashing off the bitumen. I ran toward the flashing lights. I forgot about safety, didn't wait for Andy. I ran past the rear of their car, noticed the holes in their back windscreen. Fuck, 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 fuck. A cop was leaning over someone in the road in front of their car lit up by the headlights. Help me with her, he was yelling as I moved in. 
He was stuffed. He had taken a round on his shoulder and was bleeding heavily. His blue shirt, already dark from the rain, was covered in the darkest stain running down his arm. He was on his ass in the mud beside the road. Another dark shiny patch spread over his lower trouser leg. I was frozen to the spot, hadn't seen a colleague hurt this bad. What the fuck, I was going around in circles in my head, trying to assess the situation, plan a way forward. Then I remembered why he yelled at me. I looked down at the person lying on the ground beside him. My will went shiny grey at the edges, then black. I leaned forward to try and get some blood back into my head. Shit, Gabby. She'd been on my recruit wing. We were at the college at the same time. We were pretty close. Her eyes were open, but they were vacant. Blood flowed out of her mouth, bubbled as it cooled at the edges. Round through the chest, through her lung, wasn't sure. The blood soaked her uniform, I glanced back at the car. More holes in the front windscreen. My vision narrowed. This is happening. I looked back down and realised I'd gone to my knees beside her. Rain was splashing around us. The hair was plastered across her face and I pulled the wet strands aside. My fingers on her carotid, but I felt nothing. Andy had brought up the first aid kit. Taking it all in, I flung the kit at the other guy and got him. He got him beside Gabby. They teach you to assess the surroundings, put on plastic shields, gloves, all that safety stuff. But this was real, not a training day. I didn't have a bowler, and neither did Gabby. I scooped what blood I could out of her mouth with my fingers and wiped it on her uniform. Since that did fuck all, I tried to turn her head, letting the red mess run out of her mouth onto the road. I rolled her head back and delivered breaths while Andy pumped her chest. I was trying to force air past the blood in her mouth. I could taste the metal and the salt. I could feel the warm stickiness staining my face as I tried to get her breathing, stopping all the time to scoop more blood away to tilt her head sideways. This routine went on for a bit before Andy began tiring. We swapped around and I did compressions. He also struggled to get his breath past the red froth coming out of Gabby's mouth and had as much luck as I had. We were just speeding things up really, pumping the lifeblood out of Gabby quicker. No way of stopping the bleeding, unable to get any air into her. We needed stuff we didn't have. We were fighting a losing battle. We weren't doctors. We couldn't make the call. And we're sure as hell weren't going to stand around and not try anything either. Not with our mate dying beside us. Her partner was in a bad way too, losing blood fast, but he'd managed to bandage up his leg. He was struggling with his shoulder though. I continued compressions and Andy stopped with the breathing, giving the guy a hand. I don't remember much more of the night. Things blurred into one and I couldn't be sure of the order of events. The rain didn't let up. More cop cars came from somewhere. Medics arrived and took over. Gabby had been dead a while by then. Detectives from the CIB turned up and took charge. Tents went up to protect what little hadn't already been washed away. Some bosses walked around. Cordons went up and I ended up back at one of them out on the highway. I was soaked. Rain, mud, Gabby's blood, their partner's blood. The water stopped it from drying. It covered me. Face, neck, uniform flowed down across my arms. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Didn't know what was going on. People raced around, but no one gave me too much attention, I don't really remember. My head spun and my vision began to close off again. Nauseous, I leant against the car at the cordon, but the feeling kept rising. I pushed myself up off the bonnet and saw the red impression I'd made with my body. The rain diluted the stain, and my vision closed off completely for a brief moment. I dropped my head, it returned, and then the ball of sick rose too far. consistently called dark, gritty, complex. Being a police officer is all of that and more. Uh, not that I've been a police officer, but I was, I'm imagining. I was a customs officer. Could you have written this book without the experience of being a police officer? Or how did your experience drive the narrative of this book? Um, for me, absolutely not. Um, I'm someone that writes, I can only write what I know. I failed year 12 English. And the author I've read the most of is probably Dr. Seuss, so I'm not a creative writer by trade. Um, and when I was in the police, reading a few crime stories, you read a few and you go, that's not how it happens. And everyone knows what we see on TV and mostly read is not how it actually happens. And I just wanted to write something that seemed a bit realistic, I guess. Thank you. Uh, most people wouldn't believe the things you've seen as a police officer. So how do you choose what to write? Do you choose something palatable to the reading public? Or the raw truth disguised as fiction? What serves your readers best? I've got a pretty tiny target market. So when I set out to write this, I was writing for a couple of mates, a few people in the police, 
I met my wife and that was it. So yeah, it's, it's the raw truth. Um, I've never signed the Official Secrets Act like Ian, so I can basically pick a whole lot of real stuff and then just fluff it up with some fiction and call it fiction. So that's essentially what I've done here. Um, all the stuff that happens in the book happens as it actually does. There's probably just an entire police force's crimes compressed into one story to make it not boring. Okay, thank you very much.